Hello, this lecture is on the industrial society of the late 19th century. The rise of industrial life in the United States brought meaningful change. The victory of wage labor over slave labor, one of the consequences of the Civil War, ensured more industrial growth and transformation. Farming still had the largest number of workers, but outside of agriculture, there was less self employment. An increasing number of Americans did wage work in urban settings. The labor force was plentiful, enhanced by a great wave of immigration. Industry increased in the city since factories did not require a river to power the machines. New inventions further fueled American prosperity. An essential an essential economic development of the 19th century was the construction of a railroad system that linked all parts of the United States. This laid the groundwork for an integrated national economy. Looking beyond the local setting, the efforts of industrialists such as John D. Rockefeller improved the lives of millions. With a large workforce, a plentiful supply of raw materials, an impressive railroad system, modern business techniques, and minimal labor radicalism, the United States became the world's leading industrial power on the eve of the 20th century. With slavery gone, a healthy free enterprise economic system guided the nation to economic prosperity. America witnessed a period of extraordinary industrial growth, which included the concentration of industry. Large companies emerged with larger units of production, distribution, and financial organization. Large factories were more efficient and produced items more cheaply than small factories that had less capital and the latest technology. The large factories, however, had, had to operate near full capacity to recover the huge capital outlays of, for machines and material. To stay in business, it was vital to have high volume manufacturing and low per unit production costs. Many workers welcomed new opportunities. Historians point to the benefits of machines. For example, machines, quote, secured freedom by liberating humanity from dulling labor and by, and by increasing material bounty. Aspects of factory work could be re repetitious, but machines did most of the work and they did it quickly. This contrasted, for example, with hour after hour of back-breaking shovel or pickaxe task. The workforce consisted of three broad categories, the highly skilled, the semi-skilled, and the unskilled. Highly skilled workers were construction and factory foremen, and those who possessed highly skilled hand handicraft abilities that had yet to be replaced with machines. Semi-skilled workers included those who were in established crafts, such as carpenters, bricklayers, pipe fitters, and others. The largest category of the, of the workers were the unskilled laborers. In many cases, operating machines required very little training or experience. Domestic servants made up, a, uh, made up a sizable proportion of unskilled workers. Society was more urban and industrial, but the old values of individual responsibility and working hard persisted. There was no issue finding workers for the factories. For one, improved farm machinery required fewer workers on farms. Second, the most and more importantly, between the years 1860 and 1890, there was a wave of immigration that numbered 10 million. 
Approximately two thirds came from Western and Northern Europe. If they did choose farm life, many Germans and Scandinavians settled in Midwest cities such as Chicago, Cincinnati, and Milwaukee. English and Irish immigrants tended to settle in cities along the Atlantic seaboard. A later wave of immigrants came principally from Southern and Eastern Europe. They came mostly for economic reasons and tended to settle in the cities of the Northeastern and North Central states. As immigrants poured into the cities, city populations increased and population densities became massive. The five largest cities around the turn of the century were New York, nearly 5 million, Chicago at 1.7 million, Philadelphia, 1.3 million, St. Louis, 600,000, and Boston, 560,000. Accelerating urban growth place great place urgent demands on public utilities, transportation systems, and fire and police departments. City politicians raised taxes, issued bonds, and created new municipal departments. A new kind of professional politi politician was the city boss. The boss and his machine gave tax breaks to favored contractors and extracted graft from the municipal bureaucracies. There were always politicians willing to entertain corrupt practices. Despite the corruption, cities saw significant improvements as architects and planners redesigned the street system built new sewer and water mains, and developed broad boulevards, urban parks, and recreational facilities. One vision was to separate shopping and housing areas from industrial districts and erect public buildings on a grand scale to inspire the citizens. Cities spread out and they grew vertically. The skyscraper became the symbol of the new city. In Chicago, aided by the Great Fire of 1871, a downtown reconstruction provided an unprecedented opportunity for experimentation of the skyscraper. Architects began to use an eternal skeleton of steel and iron beams instead of masonry walls to support upper floors. The technology was to go higher. The first skyscraper was completed in Buffalo in 1895. The guaranteed um, building rose 13 floors. Again, seen as the first skyscraper. America was rich in raw materials for urban and industrial growth. There was abundant timber, coal, iron, oil, lead, copper, zinc, sulfur, and others. First coal and later oil were essential sources of energy for industry and transportation. Technological improvements allowed better use of iron ore. The Bessemer process took iron ore and converted it into steel. A rags to riches story, Andrew Carnegie built advanced steel mills. He understood that, quote, stronger, more durable and elastic steel, end of quote, was superior to iron for construction and transportation. Americans were fascinated by rail transportation. As early as 1848, writer Ralph Waldo Emerson noted that the railroads were the only sure topic of conversation, the only one which interests farmers, merchants, boys, women, saints, philosophers, and fools. 
Historian Henry A. Adams wrote that the task of building a railway system consumed the energies of a generation, for it required all the new machinery to be created. Capital, banks, mines, furnaces, shops, powerhouses, technical knowledge, mechanical population, together with a steady remodeling of social and political habits, ideas, and institutions to fit the new scale and the new conditions. As America's first big business, railroads required tens of millions of dollars compared to, say, the largest textile mills that required no more than one million in capital. One example is the Pennsylvania Railroad. In the 1870s, its expansion project called for 78 million worth of securities. 70 million dollars worth of securities. Steel production was pivotal for railroad construction in the post-Civil War period. By the turn of the century, the United States possessed over 200,000 miles of railroad track which provided cheap and speedy transportation of agricultural commodities and manufactured goods, as well as jumping, jump-starting the development of other industries. One outstanding businessman was John D. Rockefeller. The oldest of six children, Rockefeller was raised in a stable family, but there were times when his peddler father found it hard to make ends meet. His mother was a godly woman who taught Rockefeller to put God first in his life, uphold honesty, and be willing to assist those in need. After graduating from Cleveland Public High School in Ohio, he began working as an assistant bookkeeper. He was 16 years old and he earned 50 cents per day. His first partner testified of Rockefeller's honesty, quote, if there was a cent due us, he wanted it. If there was a cent due a customer, he wanted the customer to have it. At the age of 19, he dealt with thousands of dollars in the grain shipping business on Lake Erie. Rockefeller married Lori Spe Laura Spellman, who was a strong Christian. They attended the Erie Street Baptist Church and supported various mission, foreign missions and the poor. When Samuel Ad Andrews, a fellow church member, invested in oil refining, Rockefeller did likewise. People knew that the United States had oil, but no one knew what to do with it. If, far if farmers found it on their property, they attempted to plow around it. In 1855, an American chemist named Benjamin Silliman Jr. took oil and distilled and purified it. It yielded kerosene, which offered better light than the popular whale oil, that is the, the fuel for lanterns. However, there were two notable problems with crude oil, how to get out of the ground and how to transport it to markets. In 1859, an experimental 30-foot derrick for drilling oil was a success. Few people believed you could pump oil out of the ground, but the, this derrick and others that followed proved that oil could be pumped out. In 1865, Rockefeller and Andrews built an oil refinery. Rockefeller's goal was to cut waste and produce the best products and offer them at the lowest price possible. In producing kerosene, the gasoline byproduct initially had little value at the time. In addition to gasoline, there were tars, naphtha, Vaseline, and paraffin. When building refineries, Rockefeller almost half the cost of labor, pipes, and plumbing materials. 
He did not hire work out if he and his men could build any necessary equipment themselves. In 1870, their enterprise was renamed Standard Oil. Rockefeller had a vision. We saw the vast possibilities of the oil industry, stood at the center of it, and brought our knowledge and imagination and business experience to bear in a dozen, in 20, in 30 directions. Decades before electric lights and automobiles, the main use of petroleum was the production of kerosene for lamps. Kerosene was a wonderful addition to the common masses. Historian Burton W. Folsom writes, before 1870, only the rich could afford whale oil and candles. The rest had to go to bed early to save money. By the 1870s, with the drop in the price of kerosene, middle and working class people all over the nation could afford the one cent an hour that it cost to light their homes at night. Working and reading became after dark activities new to most Americans in the 1870s. In an 1885 letter to one of his partners, Rockefeller declare, declared, quote, let the good work go on. We must ever remember we are refining oil for the poor man and he must have it cheap and good. Most Americans chose standard oil, even preferring it to coal oil, whale oil, and electricity. For one, one cent per hour, Americans could light up their home with standard oil. Standard oil was the largest refinery in America, and Rockefeller struck deals with the railroads that gave the company significant rebates for its high volume business. Soon he was buying out inefficient oil companies. He cared less about their outmoded equipment and more about their good personnel. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company controlled, eventually controlled 90% of America's oil refining. The company had lowered the price of oil from 58 cents to eight cents a gallon. However, in the early 1880s, the oil industry experienced difficult times when oil fields dried up and electricity began to be a strong competitor for lighting American homes. Russia began selling its abundant source of oil and thus capturing some of Standard Oil's foreign markets. Rockefeller turned its focus on new oil discoveries near Lima, Ohio, even though it had a sulfur base and thus stank like rotten eggs. According to Joseph C., chief oil buyer for, for Standard Oil, quote, Mr. Rockefeller went on, bit, went on buying leases in the Lima field in spite of the coolness of the rest of the directors until he had accumulated more than 40 million barrels of that sulfurous oil in tanks. He must have invested millions of dollars in buying and storing and holding the sour oil for two years when everyone else thought it was no good." Quote, end of quote. So Rockefeller was confident that chemists could find a method to purify the oil, which they did. To counter the Russians who had more oil, were closer to European and Asian markets, and benefited from high protective tariffs on American oil, which was the case with a number of European nations, Rockefeller relied on his research team to get more, to get more use out of each barrel and improve large steamship tankers. He studied foreign markets to learn the best methods for selling oil. When Europeans preferred buying kerosene in small quantities, he supplied tank wagons to sell them oil street by street. Standard oil victories against Russia represented, quote, 
a narrow triumph of efficiency over superior natural advantages. Standard Oil generated tens of thousands of jobs in America, but it also played a significant uh, improvement in, elsewhere. For example, to the Governor General of India, a Standard Oil foreign agent stated, I may claim for petroleum that is something of a civilizer as promoting among the poorest classes of these countries and a host of evening occupations, industrial, educational, and rec rec recreative, not feasible prior to its introduction. And if it has brought a fair reward to the capital ventured in its development, it has also carried more cheap comfort into more poor homes than almost any discovery of modern times. Rockefeller's success home and abroad made him the wealthiest man in American history. For consumers, industrialists promoted mass production that offered a wide array of material essentials and comforts at increasingly affordable prices. Certainly a corporation could do much good. Unlike a company owned by individuals, family, or partners, a corporation is owned by many people. A corporation can pursue economic activities too large to be financed by an individual or family. Corporation rose, rose, rose much uh, capital through the sale of stocks. Economist Thomas Sowell writes, quote, the economies of scale and the lower prices which large corporations can achieve as a result and the correspondingly higher standard of living resulted from these e economies of scale enable vast numbers of consumers to, to be able to afford many goods and services that could otherwise be beyond their financial means. In short, the significance of the corporation in the, in the economy at large extends far beyond those people who own, manage, or work for corporations. The emergence of big, in, big industry did not occur without problems. Historical interpretations of how, Americans, how American workers adapted to the new industrial urban climate vary widely. Scholars on the political left paint a grim picture. They argue that conditions of life and labor in the emerging industrial capitalist economy were exceedingly harsh. At best, the industrialists were paternalistic. At worst, they were tyrants. Left historians point to sweatshops, long hours, child labor, and lack of workplace safety. The Marxist view holds that a working class was deprived of both the benefits of the industrial economy and an influential voice in government. Economic downturns meant unemployment and hunger. According to Marxist theory, many employers viewed their employees as an inexpensive and easily replaceable element of their corporate structure. Employers devised new methods to extract as much labor from their workers as possible. In other words, a left-wing interpretation claims that a powerful new business philosophy guaranteed the inequity inequalities of capitalism. Although historians critical of capitalism fail to provide convincing evidence of widespread abuses, the rise of labor unionism is proof that there were genuine worker grievances in an era when local, state, and national governments were often unsupportive of the concerns of wage earners. At the end of the century, three 
0.4% of those employed in the manufacturing industries were under the age of 16. The textile industries employed the highest number of young teens. The percentage of young teens employed was very small, but there was reason to be concerned with the welfare of any young worker. The two most pressing concerns for union leaders were to make the workday shorter and improve wages. In 1868, Congress reduced the number in public employment to an eight hour day, but industrialists continued to demand long hours from their employees. From 1860 to 1890, the real wages of workers in manufacturing industries increased 49%, but union leaders wanted even higher wages. Worrisome were periods of unemployment when businesses slowed down. And this, of course, would be the case when there were various panics. In the early stage of industrialization, modern unions were generally illegal. Until the late 19th century, labor unions catered to highly skilled workers. The earlier unions avoided radical politics and expensive strikes. The union, le union leaders concentrated on winning better wages and work conditions through collective bargaining and compromise. The task was not an easy one for union organizers. There was no unity of workers. There was skill, nationality, religious, and political divisions among workers. Labor, labor union, unionists worried that the return of soldiers at the end of the Civil War would glut the labor market and cause wages to fall. Although labor unionism grew, the number of workers belonging to unions was modest. One fraternal order, the noble and holy order of the Knights of Labor had been in operation since 1869, but the organization's commitment to secrecy hindered significant growth. Why secrecy? The fraternal order guarded against the potential firing and blacklisting of workers involved in labor organization. In 1879, the Knights of Labor, under the leadership of Terence Powderly, dropped their secrecy program. Large numbers of skilled and unskilled workers joined the Knights. However, socialist ideas crept into the Knights. They advocated public ownership of railways and gas plants. They viewed workers as representing the, quote, producing classes, whereas bankers, lawyers, and liquor dealers, etc., were the non-producers. The Knights were notable for the inclusion of immigrant factory hands, Southern Blacks, and working class women. The Knights of Labor, Knights of Labor members were offered a collected alternative to the promises of individual advancement held out by industrial capitalism. Solidarity began at the local assembly hall. An assembly hall consisted of an assembly room and cooperative store. The store provided workers with daily material needs. In the assembly room, workers heard labor sermons, read reform papers, listened and debated political and economic issues. Quote, within the local assembly, workers found themselves surrounded with a symbolism and an imagery that emphasized labor solidarity and reminded all, the, reminded all of the nobility and virtue of the labor reform, reform crusade and the dignity of honesty, honest work, end of quote. The Knights 
held balls, picnics, parades, thus creating community and a comfortable environment. The Knights of Labor won important concessions from, employ from employers in the early 1880s. In 1884 and 1885, the Knights had successful strikes in which companies abandoned plans to reduce wages. By 1886, there were 15,000 local assemblies and almost 1 million members. This was the high mark. In March 1886, the Knights of Labor went on strike at Southwestern Railroad, but they called off the strike when business leaders refused to yield to additional demands. Some workers were charged with assault, sabotage, and conspiracy, which put the Knights on the defensive. Other activity by political radicals hurt the labor movement. In, in Chicago, 40,000 workers went on strike demanding an eight-hour day. A small minority of the leaders were socialists and anarch anarchists. Two, two days later, a violent clash occurred at the McCormick Reaper Works between workers for and against strike action. Tragically, two workers were fatally shot. Anarchist August Spies called for a protest rally the following day at Haymarket Square in Chicago, but only a small crowd appeared. When the police attempted to break up the meeting, someone threw a bomb which killed a policeman and others. One reporter described the episode as wild carnage. The haymaker incident and killing of the policemen spurred civic leaders to respond forcefully. The Chicago press had no sympathy for those who promoted violence for the cause of workers. Eight anarchist leaders were quickly arrested, charged with conspiracy to commit murder, tried, convicted, and sentenced for execution. In the end, four were hung, one committed suicide, and the remaining three received pardons years later. The radicals were convinced that only violence could emancipate workers. In the end, anarchy and violence divided and demoralized the labor movement. For example, after 1886, the Knights of Labor lost one strike after another. The Knights were not responsible for the hay market terror, but in the public mind, they were associated with it. There were only 100,000 members in 1890, a devastating decline from the high of almost 1 million. The Knights of Labor's growth was also hit by the withdrawal of craft unions to form the American Federation of Labor, the first modern union. The AFL, led by Samuel Gompers, emphasized bread and butter tactics without any hint of socialism. On the Haymarket tragedy, comp Gompers declared, quote, the effect of that bomb was that it not only killed the policeman, but it killed our eight hour movement for that year and for a few years after, notwithstanding we had absolutely no con connection with these people. And these people, he's referring to the anarchists. Pomp Gompers pursued a conservative approach. The AFL trade unionists possessed skills that gave them the ability to bargain effectively with their employers. The a a AFL recognized that the industrial system was permanent and, and, they, and it concentrated on practical steps to improve wages and working conditions. 
the American people were receptive to peaceful protests, but when labor activists adopted violence, they lost many supporters. Most workers themselves shun idealistic, utopian, or socialistic schemes which made extravagant promises for the future. Late 19th century workers preferred objectives that might be realized in the here and now. Any fair examination of America's late 19th century industrial society will see that industrialization raised the standard of living of all Americans. People generally had more affordable clothes, food, and living arrangements. Life expectancy increased. In 1870, it was close to 40 years. And then in 1900, it rose uh, close to 50 years. So life, and ex life expectancy increased in this short period of time. And also child mortality decreased. With a growing workforce, ample supply of raw materials, an impressive railroad system, technological advances, outstanding business visionaries, and minimal labor radicalism, the United States became the world's leading industrial power. Thank you.